Good evening, everyone. We're uh, just waiting for everyone to join, so uh, we'll, we'll give it a couple of minutes. Okay, it's a couple minutes after seven. Uh, we appreciate uh, everyone joining us. Um, we have, seems like we have a, most of our attendees joining. I'm sure we'll have some uh, that join as, as the hour goes on. So um, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Jason Fitzgerald. I am the treasurer of 1848 Properties. I'm also a member of the 1848 Housing Committee um, and a graduate of the Beta Upsilon chapter at the University of Vermont. Um, tonight's webinar, we're gonna cover um, preparing your individual housing corporations and graduate brothers for uh, housing renovations within the next 10 years. Um, we'll cover some of the planning aspects that go along with a renovation, um, and most importantly, what you should start preparing now. Um, to that end, we're lucky to have uh, Woody Ratterman of CSL Management uh, and Mark Wilkinson of uh, C Columns Fundraising joining us. Woody will be discussing the aspects of your house that should be the target of your renovation dollars and how to prepare, not just through a reserve study, but an assessment overview and a, C, uh, and a CapEx plan. From there, Mark will walk us through his roadmap to prepare your graduates for that all important ask, uh, a pledge to your capital campaign. Uh, both Mark and, and Woody have prepared uh, to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, um, but we're, it's our hope that uh, this is more of an open conversation. So Dio, I'll ask you to unmute people once Woody starts talking, just so uh, people can um, ask questions and you know, feel free to stop Woody, Mark, or myself at any time and, and uh, with your question and, and comments if you have them. Um, if you are a little shyer, shy, um, we will um, save about 20 minutes at the end for a kind of open discussion and, and uh, hopefully, um, get your questions answered then. Um, so before we begin, uh, if there's no questions from, from anyone, I'll, I'll stop for a second just to see if there are. Dio, can you just confirm everybody is off mute and can ask those? No, they are. Okay, great. All right. Um, Let's get going. So let me introduce Woody Ratterman. Uh, Woody is a managing partner of CSL Management. Uh, he is a member of Beta Theta Pi, which we won't hold against him. Uh, he is a graduate of Middle Tennessee State. Um, Woody has more than 25 years of experience in operational consulting, risk management, capital raising, and murder, mergers and acquisitions. Um, Woody, thanks for joining us, and uh, you can take it from here. Thanks, Jason, and good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. Uh, as Jason said, uh, my name is Woody Ratterman, managing partner with CSL. Our company, for those of you that may not be familiar with us, uh, we focus primarily in four areas, one being the day-to-day -day management of fraternity and sorority housing. Uh, the sorority, fraternity and sorority space is the only space that we work in uh, as a company. So the day-to-day -day management of chapter houses is the primary scope of the work that we do. We also do facility assessments, which we're talking about tonight, a service that uh, was started from day one that uh, was a uh, idea and a brainchild of my brother and our founding partner who's on our phone, uh, it's on the call tonight as well, Steve Ratterman. We also do project management, uh, which we're gonna walk through a little bit with you tonight, some of the conversations that we have with our clients when we're starting the project process, and we'll share a little bit about, especially on the CapEx, side of the equation and, and preparing a pro forma and thinking through what is this all gonna cost. And then the fourth bucket that we work on is an education and consulting. We do a lot of work with training, training of house directors, volunteers, working with uh, house court boards, national organizations on their housing, 
initiatives and consulting on that front. So let's go to the next slide and start through. We're gonna we're gonna bifurcate, if you will, two two different areas we're gonna focus on. The first one's gonna be on the assessment. So when we're looking at and talking with clients that might be considering taking on a major substantial project, uh, one that's going to require architects, engineers, fundraising, which we know Mark's going to speak to a little bit later, one of the first things we're going to ask them is when's the last time they've had their facility assessed? And for us, it's just we look at the assessment as a, as a checkup, it's a scoreboard, if you will. How's the facility performing? Uh, what's the useful life of the, the rest of the mechanical equipment that's in there? Where are our repair and maintenance needs? Do we have a good understanding of the history? A lot of times what we see in the transfer or perpetuation, if you will, of volunteers year over year over year, sometimes we lose. When was the last time we replaced the roof? When was the last time we painted? Things of that nature. So we're really trying to uh, understand the facility and all the dynamics of it, come up with some type of roadmap, if you will, CapEx plan, which we'll dive deeper in here in a minute. And lastly, at the end of the day, our goal when we're going through the assessment process is that it creates a historical document. Some point in time, if for some reason as a volunteer, as a board member, uh, the we all go missing and no one can find anybody that has any idea what's happened to this facility over the last 15, 20 years. The hope and the idea is they found this assessment uh, that it would give them some type of historical data, at least over the last five years, of what was going on, who our vendors were, what was the life safety situation like, how were our mechanicals uh, at that time, room layouts, things of that nature. So, that's the process in of itself and why we're we're wanting to do the assessment again getting a good ground level start uh, as we can start making decisions and where we need to invest those dollars yeah let's go to the next slide uh, the process in of itself and when we're actually on site and what we're looking for uh, certainly uh, and i want to say from an assessment standpoint even if there's uh, you don't have interest bringing in a third party, you don't have the budget for it, whatever it may be, you guys just think you can handle it on your own, which is is fine. Our recommendation in that scenario, though, is that you're at least bringing someone in that's an alum that may have some understanding of buildings and hasn't been there in a while, right? If you've been a volunteer for a long time and you've walked into facilities or into that chapter house day in and day out, you're not going to notice some things that may be significant. Uh, the story we always tell is of a, uh, of a um, crown molding along a ceiling uh, in a living room uh, had separated also slightly and, and Steve was actually the one that did it did the assessment at that time and separated also slightly didn't look right didn't feel right and certainly if you've been in that living room year in and year out you may have never even noticed it uh, and lo and behold what happened within about uh, three months uh, that entire structure was reinforced with structural membranes all the way from the top to the basement uh, with support until they could get the uh, situation uh, rectified structurally. So it's really important just to have someone that does not see the facility time in and time out to do that assessment for you if you're not gonna bring in a professional. Some of the things that we look for when we're doing our assessments, obviously on the exterior, how's our roof, how are our, um, even in the grading, how, how can we see if water is moving away from the facility, the gutters, windows, uh, our brick, tuck pointing, uh, anything that we can see if there's cracks uh, in the foundation or anywhere in, on the exterior of the building itself. So again, getting a really good idea of where we sit uh, from a foundation on the exterior point, especially knowing that many of these houses and the ages that they are uh, certainly will have telltale signs if we have a problem. Then we then we normally start in the assessment going from the basement all the way to the attic into the roof if we are able to get onto the roof uh, safely for sure. We're looking in the mechanical areas, storage. You know, a lot of the things that we look on the mechanical is certainly uh, useful life. Uh, are we seeing areas of rust or damage or leaks or anything that may be a tell sign of it uh, wearing out, if you will? Also, we're looking for the life safety components. You know, a common thing that we see, and, and certainly you may have seen this if you've gone through fire marshal inspections or something similar, how much storage is around our facility or around our mechanical units? Are they easily accessible? Do we have that three foot clearance? Things of that nature. We're also looking at our breakers, uh, breaker boxes, the electrical components, uh, making sure all of those things are in good sound um, 
conditions. Kitchen is a big area that we, there's a lot of focus. Again, equipment, safety, cleanliness, how uh, the area is used, uh, especially when it comes to serving. And of course, as you might be looking at and, and thinking through renovations right now because of the pandemic, certainly has a lot of people thinking through how our food is serviced uh, and how it's not only produced, but how it's served. On the house director front, um, certainly if your facility has a house director uh, in a, in, or an area for a house director, looking at that, uh, we look at that uniquely in, in a, as an idea too, from the standpoint of how competitive is the space, right? We wanna attract, if you uh, have the opportunity and the ability to hire a house director, really wanna find a good one. And a lot of times their willingness to come to our facility is gonna be determined by what kind of space we're providing them. So we'll take a careful eye of that knowing of all the house director suites that we see throughout the country, we want to make sure that it's competitive in the amenities that it's uh, offering. And then the residential floors, really on the bedrooms themselves, just going through, looking at the paint, the flooring, the light fixtures, uh, you know, from an eye of a condition, uh, right? Right now, especially uh, in this day and age, we talk a lot on the men's side of the equation about competition and the quality of our facilities and being able to compete uh, especially on the cleanliness, especially on the wear and tear. So really going through those spaces, the bathrooms, your corridors, and looking at, uh, does it look tired? Uh, even if it looks tired, is it at least clean? Because uh, some of these things of just paint, uh, light fixtures, uh, small uh, winds that we call them can go a long way in terms of creating a more sense, of, a better sense, if you will, that the facility is not only being well-maintained, but it's not aging as quickly. So those are things in our report uh, that we go through. And Dio, let's go ahead and share, if we can share my screen. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm looking over here for those that you're on video. But I wanted to kind of give you an example of what uh, an assessment actually looks like on our end and what we're, what we're covering. Can everybody see my screen okay? Okay, perfect. So as I said, as we, as what we've done in organizing ours, one of the, big things that we like to do is immediate action items because these these plans take a while to develop. So one of the things that we do is we go through and say, okay, while we're waiting for the CapEx plan and the, the full report, what are just immediate wear and tear maintenance item things that we're seeing on the property uh, that need to take immediate action? It might be a leak, uh, it might be an electrical issue, uh, something of that nature, but we're gonna start right there we learned early on, uh, if any of you guys know, my brother and myself, we like to pontificate for a long time. And our first early assessments were probably 50, 60, 70 pages of a lot of verbal vomit. Uh, we got some very good constructive criticism uh, early on saying, look, you know, put all the meat at the beginning and then the rest of the pages, if we want to go that far, we can. So we try to do that in the first six or seven pages and giving those immediate action items then we go into the history and the stats of the building. Again, trying to create that document of what were the last, what investments did we make in the last five years? What are our room and board rates? How many beds? What was our occupancy looking like at this time? Parking spaces, primary contacts, things of that nature. Then we get into service providers. Again, history, trying to build some, some type of uh, warehouse, if you will, for you within this process of that you know who your vendor strategic partners were, were. And then we actually put in that five-year CapEx plan. And we're gonna talk more about that here in a minute. Uh, life expectancy of, uh, life safety, excuse me, and inspection worksheet. So what are we required to do? Every town, every city, every municipality, it's always different in terms of what the requirements are on the life safety front. So we're capturing that, our inspectors, we ask risk management questions, which our, our insurance uh, providers always appreciate checking in it. Mechanical assets, kitchen assets that we're looking through. And then we go floor area by area. So exterior, ranking, the basement, first floor. Uh, you can see where we're doing bedroom conditions, paint, wall, trying to get some type of score for you guys as you try to take this information and make decisions from it. And then lots and lots of pictures, All right? So if you think about your, and Dio, that's, that's fine. We can go back to the slide. But if you think about a, a typical home inspection that you may be familiar with as it relates to uh, if you're buying a house, they're coming in and they're looking at a lot of these things 
as well, but they're also looking at maybe the temperature of your water, uh, different elements uh, that are more uh, specified to a residential scenario. Here, we're really taking more of a commercial approach, but we also put a slight twist in it because we really want to look at it from a competitive standpoint and making our re recommendations, not only from a life expectancy, a life safety standpoint, but also from a competitive standpoint as it relates to the other uh, options that are being provided on the campus. Because we know right now competition is, is, is very important. So that's the assessment. So again, step one, uh, if you haven't gone through that process, either as a committee, inviting folks that haven't seen the facility in a while and, talk, and, and going from top to bottom and listing the needs, we recommend you doing that first before we get into the planning. We need a baseline. So once we have that baseline, then we get into the capital plan and start talking through what are, how do we want to start tackling all these items that are out there. I want to first uh, remind people that the CapEx plan is slightly different than a reserve study, at least how we're working with our clients. Capital expenditure plan can be one year, be six months, five years, 10 years, whatever it may be. It's truly a plan in the best case, what decisions do we need to make today within our control that we understand with the knowledge uh, and the appreciation that tomorrow it could all change, right? For instance, you may say, we're gonna change the, we're gonna replace our boiler, $40,000 CapEx expenditure. We know it's 20 years old. We think we can get five more years out of it. So we're gonna put that in year five. The next day they go crank it and it dies. Well, you're gonna to have to adjust your CapEx plan. It is a living, breathing document. A reserve study looks, really takes the all the components of the facility, stretches it out 25 to 30 years, and looking at all the assets and puts a time, um, provides the usual useful life of that uh, item, how many years are left, and then calculates out what year, uh, if it lasts as long as it should, that you're gonna spend, and that's, and it's just numbers. Uh, bankers love it. Uh, certainly condo associations use a reserve study. So the CapEx is certainly can have all the components of a reserve study, but it typically goes beyond that with uh, planning discussions and reasonings of why we may make a decision versus another. So just want to kind of throw that distinction because you may hear, well, as a reserve study, reserve study can certainly serve the function of a CapEx plan, no doubt. Our, recommendation to you though is just to always remember something will happen uh, that's going to adjust and require you to be flexible in some of that and we have just found in our 10 years of working within this industry uh, going beyond five years which is good if you have the capacity and the time and the understanding and the expertise to uh, put everything out on that reserve study uh, and understand exactly where it sits that's great there's nothing wrong with that but we have found uh, in working with house corporations and how these houses, just given the activity that they have day in and day out, that looking at a five-year window is a good, safe uh, area to play within, if you will, as you try to make decisions. So the purpose of the CapEx plan or the reserve study, obviously, is to estimate our cash needs, our major cash needs, and when we're going to need them, right? We're talking about expenses of 2500 uh, 3000 uh, some people use 5000 as a cap in terms of those capital expenditures just significant costs outside of your tip, uh, typical operating budget that you're going to have to be spending what is that when are those dollars going to be needing because what we tell and what we always shoot for is that when you're budgeting and you're putting your budgets together the idea or the concept is is that at the end of the year we always have a 10% of our income left over that we can put into reserves. Another uh, uh, formula that folks use is two and a half percent if they own the house. So the two and a half percent of the value of your house is another formula that we've seen folks use, but we're building reserves because what we know is that within 20 and 20, between 20 to 25 years of owning a house, you're essentially gonna be rebuilding it, right? Because roofs, Asphalt shingle roofs, 25, 30 years if you're lucky. Mechanicals today, 12, 15 years if you're lucky. We're going to have to paint. We're going to have to replace flooring. We're going to have to reinvest in our bathrooms, whatever it may be. That's why we want to reserve and that's why we want to have the cash because we know wear and tear and the useful life of the facility as a whole is going to be done in 20 to 25 years. Now, some of you may have a 100-year slate roof and that's fantastic. 
uh, that, so there are some components that can go beyond that, but by and large, most of us are working within that 20 to 25 window. So the challenges that we often see when we start CapEx planning and working with our clients, who has the facility knowledge, right? Who knows when the last thing uh, the roof was done? Who knows how old the hot water heater is or the boiler or the kitchen equipment? We can't find a serial number or a date on it because it's been worn off. So that's typically a struggle in trying to uh, get the process started. Estimating, uh, thanks to Google and technology, you can go and find out about what everything costs, but it's also there are differentiators in terms of the, where the region, uh, and especially if it's a commodity right now, like wood is uh, supposedly outpacing steel in costs. So you know, estimating can be a little bit of a challenge. Managing expectations and prioritizing for by and large is where uh, we really see CapEx plan stall because as a committee and a board, you may have a great difference of opinion across uh, the table in terms of where we need to be working and what should come first and prioritizing uh, that boiler when we really love to give the guys a new gaming room because gaming's the best thing that's out there right now in recruitment and everybody games, uh, but we really got to do that boiler. It is really a give or take sometimes in that prioritization. And the minute you say we're going to go to the gaming, we think we can get three more years out of that boiler. You, know, you, you uh, demo that game to do the gaming room and the boiler goes kaput. So it, those things happen, but we can't have uh, paralysis by analysis, right? We have to make decisions and we got to keep moving forward. Next slide. So um, looking at just some pro tips that we would provide uh, and give you guys some of these I may have already hit on. One, it is a year-round process. So the CapEx planning is something that you should be doing as a board all the time, year-round, looking at the numbers, having some type of idea of uh, where you're going to have some major expenses, especially right now as we're dealing with the pandemic and you may have less tenants in your facility right now, less guys living in. We don't know what the outlook is gonna look like. It's looking better, uh, but certainly it's a year round process that you should be looking at. Uh, you have to reserve and preserve cash. If you're not doing that 10% uh, and maybe you don't have the ability to do it just because of your revenue and expense metrics, getting to that point is critical to have a successful CapEx plan. And then certainly Mark's gonna give us some tips as it relates to the fundraising piece here in just a second. Don't complicate things. It does not have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be a, a long or arduous process. Even if you just sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and write down boiler, placed it 10 years ago, I think it's about 20,000. Hot water heater we just did, so we're good there. Even if it's just written on a sheet of paper. The, the point is, is do the work, do the homework. Uh, there's a lot of tools and resources obviously available, uh, but you don't have to complicate things. It's an art form, it's not a science. Uh, you know, keep that in mind as well. Uh, this, as I said, things can change and will change. The unexpected will happen. So just be prepared for that. And if you're looking at it on a regular basis, you should be in a better position to navigate when something does come up. I've already talked to you through the 20 years to 25, that's what I'm talking about in that formula. Within 20 to 25 years, most of you will have reinvested every out of that house. You will have replaced floors, you would have paint, probably have a roof, things of that nature. Uh, and then again, get a third party opinion. Uh, if, you, if you have not had one, uh, we recommend that you get a professional in to provide it, especially if it's been uh, five years. Most uh, people out there look every three to five years and getting some type of assessment done, some type of third party opinion of their facility to make sure that what they're seeing and what they're planning makes sense. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. So just wrapping up, a couple of things again that we would tell you, you know, we'll go to the next slide, is just remember, start with the assessment. If you haven't had one, we recommend, it's a great place to start in terms of helping you plan, helping you come up with a vision and a picture, and especially for folks like Mark, they need to understand what they're selling for you. They need to understand what we're going out to fundraise for, and that assessment's a great way to start. Document, if you haven't documented uh, warranties, and when you've replaced, uh, those key components of your facility. Start that practice now, it's never too late. Set common goals, right? I think it's, again, we want to make sure for that successful fundraising side of the equation that our board and our alum and our volunteers and those key stakeholders, we're all in sync and why we're doing it 
we all share the same vision for the facility. I think it goes a long way, uh, especially on the fundraising piece. Go at least five years out. So again, we kind of stay in that five-year window, but can certainly go much longer in looking at it, but go at least five years and thinking about what your capital needs are gonna be. Understand the long-term value of your needs. Uh, again, if you go five, make sure if there's something on the horizon, especially significant like a bathroom remodel, a roof, things of that nature that you understand where it is. And we can't say it enough right now, especially preserve that cash, save, save, save. So with that, turn it over to Mark and to Dio and the rest of the group. Thanks so much. Woody, thanks so much. I, I, yeah. Very helpful and, and uh, appreciate the time. Um, want to leave some time right now for some questions. I actually have one question related to the CapEx. What is the biggest mistake or misstep that you see um, for housing cores kind of doing it on their own? Um, you know, I think a lot of our housing cores may look at this and say, all right, well, you know, the first time we do this, we may do it on our own rather than reaching out to someone like, like your company. What's the big, biggest mistake or misstep or thing that they miss? Uh, the couple things come to mind. One is that we, we've not uh, accurately understood the cost. We don't have enough money in our CapEx plan. We've undershot what things truly cost because we haven't done our homework, if you will. Uh, and then there hasn't been enough time talking through uh, return on investment, pros and cons of doing, again, using the boiler as an example versus updating the chapter room or doing the boiler versus doing the bathrooms or whatever, you know, the bang for the buck, right? So we, we go straight to the fun stuff, which I totally understand and, and can appreciate, but we're not spending enough time realizing that whether we want to ignore roofs, whether we want to ignore hot water heaters and all these things that we think they're just going to last forever, they're not. And so we don't. And then the third component I would say is just taking all that with the idea of what's the experience that we want our members to have in that facility. You really should start with that question when you're going through this planning process. That's why we have the house. That's why we have our organizations. That's why we're here uh, at six o'clock my time, seven your time on a Thursday night talking about this stuff is because we're passionate and we had a great experience so really that would be our number one as a mistake of just thinking through our members today and how can this facility meet the needs of the members for the next 10 to 15 years as it is today not maybe how we did it 50 years ago right okay great yeah appreciate that any any questions for woody before we move on to mark Okay, seeing none. Um, Woody, thanks. <clears throat> thanks for your your insight. Um, we will provide Woody's uh, contact information at the end of the the presentation, and also um, as a as a as a wrap up to this. Uh, so, if you're interested in, in talking to Woody or Steve Moore, um, you can reach out directly to them. So. Um, Moving on to Mark. So uh, I want to introduce Mark Wilkinson. Mark is a uh, principal and partner of Columns Fundraising. Uh, Mark is a, uh, a Phi Gam from the great chapter of the University of Vermont. Uh, he served the fraternity as the 86th field secretary and uh, some time on staff as the director of chapter services. Um, Mark has more than 35 years of consulting and fundraising experience. And uh, as always, it's great to have you here, Mark. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason, and uh, good evening, brothers. Uh, Woody laid a great foundation for this next part of our discussion tonight, because if you don't know why you need money, you're going to have a real tough time asking your brothers for money for general purposes. You have to have an understanding of what the projects are and what the costs are. So. Let's talk a little bit about what we need to do to get ready for a major renovation or a new build. Uh, Dio, next slide, please. So before we even get to a capital campaign mentality, I would be remiss as a fundraising consultant, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind everyone that a year end is a terrible thing to waste. And what do we mean by that? Well, we've got six and a half weeks left in this calendar year, and this is the busiest time of year for giving across America. So here's some good news. 2020, obviously, is a year that many of us wish would end tonight so that tomorrow we start 2021. 
It's not going to happen that way. So we've got six and a half weeks left. Let's use it to our advantage and raise some money. We can raise some money for annual projects. Some of our house corporations do a great job running annual fundraising campaigns where the brothers kick in 100 bucks, 250 bucks, 1,000 bucks a year. And that goes for general maintenance uh, things in the chapter house. We can take advantage of that uh, this year end. What we'd recommend is identify what your must-haves are. If you want to renovate a uh, downtown, or I'm sorry, a downstairs uh, powder room or uh, the main living area, or maybe some of your recognition plaques, at least identify what they are, what they're going to cost. It's easy to get a couple of class captains. Uh, you have to be very proactive with personal visits and phone calls. Uh, I understand the personal visit issue right now. I will tell you um, in certain states, uh, visits and business are going on as usual. Uh, I happen to live in Georgia and we are not as locked down as uh, most of the rest of the country. Uh, and I was on the interstate today traveling and it was like pre-pandemic traffic levels. So uh, personal visits, phone calls, I'll also tell you, we have found incredible success with donors on Teams, Microsoft Teams calls or Zoom calls or whatever your platform is. Uh, yesterday, I was on a call with a husband and wife for one of our clients, and they committed $500,000 on a Zoom call. Uh, so, and, and that's just one of many stories that we have. Uh, individuals are making gifts. This is the new way. This is the new way of doing it. Um, Annual fundraising, annual fundraising leads to successful capital fundraising. One of the trends we're also seeing with annual fundraising is house corporations are setting aside funds for scholarships because so many students and their families have been affected by this pandemic. Uh, sometimes a thousand dollars or twenty-five hundred dollars in scholarship funds makes the difference to keep this this brother in school. Uh, and, and uh, pursuing his degree. So it might be a good time to consider establishing some scholarship funds. Let me tell you about this year and why we are so bullish on annual giving uh, and that a year end is a terrible thing to waste. Everything was looking great until March, of course. And then uh, fundraising in uh, the end of March and April kind of came to a halt until we all had a better idea of what was going on in this country. And then funders, uh, foundations and corporate entities and major donors, individuals, shifted their giving priorities to COVID-related issues, whether it be healthcare or social services or helping people pay their rent because they were facing eviction. A lot of fundraising, uh, pivoted toward COVID. Later in the summer, COVID fundraising kind of uh, slowed down, and then we had more pivoting towards social justice funding, and substantial funds were raised there. Since then, giving to all types of organizations has skyrocketed, and in fact, we are very bullish and projecting that giving in 2020 will exceed giving in 2019. And that is in spite of a pandemic, in spite of all the social unrest in this country, giving will exceed uh, what was given last year. And keep in mind, that does not include political contributions. And um, I, I don't even know what the final tally is on, on uh, dollars given to political campaigns this year, but my gut says it was a lot. Um, if, if you saw as many commercials uh, as I did on, on my TV. So that's the good news. We're excited about giving. Next slide, Dio, please. So first step after we have an annual giving program and getting our brothers accustomed to giving is we need to communicate. We need to make sure that our database, our records are updated uh, we need to maybe consider holding some virtual events. Some of our clients, fraternity clients that happen to uh, uh, 
uh, be it big football schools, uh, Big Ten schools, uh, SEC schools, and of course our clients in the SEC feel like there really is no other football conference other than the SEC, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion. Um, Steve, I said that for your benefit, knowing you went to Indiana, but uh, um, they are having virtual tailgate parties before the football games, and they are raising more money than they ever have because the brothers are relaxed, they're in their living rooms or in their home offices, they might be sharing a cocktail or two, and someone makes the ask and they're raising money again, for annual fundraising purposes. We'd also recommend a news committee be established, and this would be for graduate brothers. It's one thing to ask undergraduates to send out a newsletter or to send out e-blasts. It's another thing for graduate brothers to do it. Um, it, it is more consistent when a graduate brother does it, uh, we like hard copy, snail mail, newsletters. I know many of our chapters move away from that. Uh, it, you can't not do hard copy snail mail because when you do an e-blast, most of our chapters and most of our fraternity and sorority clients, we've found their database is only about 40% with emails. So you're losing 60% right off the bat that you're not communicating with. Um, and the other thing about snail mail, quite frankly, uh, as we age and I'm there and I have to wear these stupid things, um, I can't see your e-blast on my iPhone. I need a hard copy um, that I can read it in my con at my convenience um, after dinner at night or whatever. And we're also finding anecdotally that with all the electronic communication nowadays, uh, older alumni actually like the old fashioned way and they respond better um, to, to paper. Postcards, phone calls, all of the above are ways we need to start communicating. And please, please, please don't forget you need to communicate with parents of undergraduates because we have also had multiple parents make substantial gifts to chapters. Uh, we worked with a sorority at University of Florida recently and uh, we had uh, two sets of parents uh, step up, uh, each made a gift of $100,000 to a um, renovation uh, build, new build actually, at, the, at this chapter. So why do we talk about communicating? Well, the first step in a capital campaign is we wanna determine what the capacity is and how much your brothers would be willing to give, so we do a feasibility study. When we do feasibility studies, we survey members and we ask what they like, what they dislike, maybe their best memories of the chapter, would they be willing to help, and maybe at what specific dollar amount. The biggest issue, hands down, and this is Phi Gamma Delta and every other fraternity and every other sorority we work with, is they say, well, why would I consider giving money to my chapter when I haven't heard from them in 20 years? Um, and it's, it is, you know, it's like clockwork. We can predict uh, what these uh, graduates will say. Well, I haven't heard from them uh, in 20 years. In fact, we worked with a fraternity at a Midwestern school, private school, another fraternity, it's not Phi Gamma Delta, 100 year old chapter, 100 year old chapter, they need a new house, uh, obviously. And um, two, the letter. Every single individual we interviewed said they had never heard from their chapter since they graduated. And some of these guys were in their 70s and early 80s in age. So that meant they hadn't heard anything from their local chapter in uh, 60 or seven, uh, you know, 65 years. So it's real important that we communicate. Next slide, please. So capital fundraising is a different animal than annual giving, obviously. Annual uh, supports our immediate needs. If we're doing a $20,000 touch up in a room on the main level of the chapter house, capital is different in that it supports our long-term needs. Typical capital campaigns in the Greek world, anywhere from half a million dollars to $5 million and up. 
that also is dependent upon uh, where the schools are. Uh, typically, we see the largest capital campaigns in, in the SEC uh, in, in that arena. Uh, some of the largest chapter houses in the country have been built or are being built at the University of Alabama. Um, there, some of them are upwards, can be upwards of, of 30,000 square feet. Uh, there are many convention centers in our opinion, <laughs> but uh, they can be pretty big. Uh, let's talk about a couple of fundraising myths. This helps us prepare our graduate brothers as we go forward in thinking about a capital campaign. We always hear graduates have the money, so they'll support us. Well, yes, we've been blessed as a fraternity that we have many successful graduate brothers that have gone on to very successful careers, but just because they have the money doesn't mean they're going to give it to you. They have their churches, they have their uh, hospitals, they have alma mater, they have all kinds of other organizations pulling at them. So it is a myth to think that just because someone has money that you're entitled to it. You have to work hard, you have to communicate, you have to show the case for support and uh, cultivate that brother uh, for a gift. Another big myth, it's called the fair share campaign. We have we have been in a lot of chapter meetings uh, with graduates that will say, let's see, we need to raise a million dollars. We have a thousand graduate brothers. So if everyone kicks in a thousand bucks, campaign is done. Brothers, it doesn't work that way. Uh, in a capital effort, if you get 20% of your total graduate database to contribute, you're doing very well. Pat yourselves on the back. Uh, a lot of chapters, it might be 10%, 12%, 15%, 20% is extraordinary. So what we need to do is start educating now that um, uh, it's not a fair share campaign. In fact, fundraising 101, 25 to 30 brothers will give 80% of the goal. So that's what we want to focus on in a uh, capital campaign. And generally, the, the preparation before a, camp, uh, a capital campaign is, uh, is about two to three years. And it starts with the annual fund, it starts with uh, communication, and it starts with, uh, even before that, it starts with the assessment uh, and the CapEx as, as Woody was explaining. It all goes hand in hand. Um, we, we then move into a feasibility study. If you've successfully done the assessment, if you're communicating and your brothers are understanding and knowing what's going on um, and you've got your database cleaned up, uh, you're running an annual campaign, then we can move into a feasibility study and look at opportunities for um, campaign. Next slide. So we we are strong proponents of feasibility studies and uh, retaining an outside firm to do that feasibility study for you. They're unbiased and they will come in and interview uh, some key prospects and your house corporation board members and help understand or help you understand what the potential fundraising capacity is. When you're hiring a, uh, a consulting firm, uh, many of you have hired firms in your own businesses, you know, the standard RFP process, uh, what's the strategic advantage of the firm you're hiring? Um, this is a key question. How much time is required of your house corporation officers during a campaign? We always get asked that question. And you know what, brothers? It's going to be some time requirement. Um, and we understand that everyone has uh, a career and families and other obligations, but if the house corporation is going to be successful with their campaign, the officers have to be involved. So something to, to think about, uh, make sure that the consulting firm tells you what the roles are of your um, uh, house corporation officers. You also wanna know who will be managing your campaign effort, what kind of experience do they have, consulting fees, all the typical questions. 
but this is just uh, to keep all the firms honest, make sure you're getting apples to apples comparisons so that you uh, hire the right firm. And the last point on this slide is, can you work with the consultant? Uh, can you develop a rapport? Uh, bottom line is, do you like each other? Because the consultant is gonna play a big role in this campaign. You're gonna have a lot of phone calls, emails, meetings, uh, a lot of follow-up, so you all have to get along. And uh, um, there's a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of knowledge that consultants bring, but also we would we would say 50% of success is based on rapport for the individuals. Next slide, please, Dio. Volunteer responsibilities. This is key. We always get asked what do I have to do if I'm involved with a campaign? We always want volunteers to know what their role is before they, uh, or I should say prospective volunteers, know what their role is before they say yes. Whether it's a house corporation officer or uh, a key graduate that wants to be involved in the soliciting process and helping with the campaign, number one role of a volunteer, they have to make an individual pledge to the campaign. There is no negotiation on that. You cannot have one brother that says, well, I give of my time, so that's my gift to the campaign. Well, we value your time very much, but um, um, <laughs> without a gift, we are that much uh, away from, or farther away from uh, finishing our campaign and building our new chapter house. Every single volunteer that's on the leadership committee needs to make an individual pledge to the campaign. Attend steering committee meetings. Lately, we've been doing a lot of those via Zoom. Uh, helps identify others that can participate in the campaign, cultivates and solicits others, and then attends campaign events. Here's a key fundraising uh, uh, tip. You cannot have a brother that gives $1,000 or $500 to a campaign effort and expect him to successfully solicit a prospect that should give $100,000 to your effort. It's always easier to have the larger gift donor solicit someone at that same level or below. Uh, and the, the terminology we always, we always say is, uh, Jason, I've made a $100,000 commitment to this chapter campaign. I would like you to match that. That sounds a lot better than if I say, Jason, I've given, you, I've given $500 to this campaign effort, and I would like to ask you for $100,000 for this campaign effort. Uh, it's just, it just makes more sense. Next slide, please, Dio. So that's the end of the uh, that's the end of the official fundraising uh, tips and and uh, remember a year end is a terrible thing to waste uh, so let's get set ready go start asking your brothers ask for a specific project consider asking for a specific amount so Jason with that I'd stop take questions and. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. All, all great advice. Um, you know, I guess I'll start off the questions, Mark, for you. And and you you talked a little bit about the giving habits during during this past year and how they went. You know, from stopping to COVID to social justice, and and now you're seeing they go back. What about fraternity giving? Have you specifically about that? Have you seen that? Is that going to be a banner year th this year as well compared to last year, or is it just other causes? Uh, yes, so far, uh, anecdotally, we've spoken with several foundation executives on the national level, uh, fraternity and sorority foundations, where their giving is way up this year. Um, several of those foundations are our clients, so we kind of um, keep up to, with what they are. We're also seeing tremendous interest over the last two months from local house corporations, from all fraternities, not just Phi Gamma Delta, uh, wanting to begin a feasibility study or wanting to talk about capital campaign. Um, it's really incredible, Jason, The uh, in spite of everything that's happened this year, and we all know you just can't make this stuff up, um, in spite of everything that's happened, 
um, Americans are giving. It's really encouraging. Good. Okay, let's open it to uh, everybody else. Um, Dio, I assume everyone is still unmuted. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Lee Suter, I know you have a question about scholarship. So it looks like everyone is, is self-muted, so you need to make sure you unmute yourself. Okay. Hey, this is Billy Leslie, Tennessee Tech chapter. Um, we've been working with um, Mark Wilkerson and his group. Um, I highly recommend them if you, if you all need um, any fundraising efforts and, and things like that. They've, they've done a great job for us. Uh, we broke ground last month on our new house. So hopefully by next August, we'll we'll have it built. So um, they've done, I'm still waiting on that phone call for that $500,000 donation that you talked about earlier. I hadn't gotten that one yet. So um, I hope to hear from you later. So appreciate it. <laughs> hey, Billy, that was nice. Thank you. Um, and we didn't talk before this webinar at all. So um, obviously I appreciate your comments. The, uh, uh, one other thing, one other thing I would add though is is um, you talked about foundations briefly a minute ago, um, and a lot of people aren't aware of, of sometimes you can fundraise um, with a tax advantage um, for some donations and things like that. So that's important to know if you work with uh, Ben Robinson and the, at at IHQ, um, and but just make sure you know what you're doing before you jump into that arena. So to that point, Mark, I assume you, uh, when when a, a chapter or a housing court comes to you, you you can facilitate facilitate the conversation with Ben and and help that them through that aspect of it. Absolutely. The um, the the rules are that uh, in a chapter house, there's space that's considered educational and charitable in nature. There's space that's non-educational, and then there's ancillary space, uh, which would be stairwells and you know areas that no one lives in or or uses um you know all the time so educational space the cost for that can be a deductible expense and with billy and, and our theta ta chapter at tennessee tech uh we ran some of the larger contributions through the foundation in lexington and then it's Ben's job and the foundation's job to grant those funds back to Theta Ta uh, for building purposes. But the key thing is the donor gets that charitable tax deduction value. It, uh, at Theta Ta, um, it was exciting because one of the early brothers in the chapter, one of the original brothers, uh, stepped forward with a $100,000 challenge grant. Um, and and we successfully met it when it was announced that he was giving that um, other brothers kicked in uh, so it makes a difference and and tax deductible giving obviously uh, helped I will tell you statistically when you uh, when you do the surveys as to why people give the number one reason is not because it's tax deductible it's not for uh, recognition uh, on a wall or naming a room or the chapter house. Number one reason why people give is because they were asked and they were asked by a peer and they were asked to join what that peer has already done. Okay. Hey, uh, oh, no, hey, hey, Jason, it's it's Lee. I'll, I'll bite on your question here. Uh, it's not actually about scholarship. Uh, hey, Mark, good to see you again. Um, uh, you were talked about the the goal is to have the senior people involved with a, a, any kind of type of campaign um, be kind of lead donors on some of this in order to be able to more uh, efficiently and effectively talk to their peers about kind of matching for instances where there might not be the same kind of 
key donor up front uh, is the general idea that there's kind of a, a, a ratio of kind of how much you can ask over how much your main kind of involved brothers have donated? Or is it just kind of capping out at don't ask for more than you've donated? What's the kind of general rule of thumb in that? So that's a great question, Lee. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Lee is also a Vermont uh, Fiji. And uh, gosh, Jason, what a great chapter that Vermont group must be. Um, although I think we're closed now, aren't we? Well, we didn't have to bring that up, but yeah. I know. I know. Um, but a uh, great question, Lee. So what we do with our clients, and we work beyond Greek institutions, we'll work with schools and uh, colleges, universities, hospitals. Uh, we always do uh, donor screening, and there are firms out there that do it where we submit the name, address, and any information, demographic information we have on them, and they can do a profile and determine maybe who your best prospects are that have assets. Uh, and uh, several of those companies that we use, there's uh, one called Wealth Engine. And there's another called donor search. We use donor search because it seems to get the best uh, aggregation of, of information, but it will determine real estate holdings. It'll determine political contributions at the state and federal level. And that's very, very key. I mean, it's all information that all of us can find. It's just so time consuming. They can turn around a database of a thousand names in about two hours. So it'll come back and we'll be able to look at it and see who your best prospects are uh, based upon real estate holdings, based upon previous giving. So when we're working with uh, hospitals and we find out donors have given to health related causes, there are gonna be some good prospects. The donor search also gives you a recommended ask amount. So it's really not based upon what they give annually. Um, a capital ask is much higher than an annual ask. So, and it's it's amazing, uh, it's amazing and scary all at the same time. The information that's out there on all of us. Yeah, uh, no, I, I I appreciate that. That's a, <laughs> yeah, I, I just because I know um, having worked with some of the younger chapters and some of the smaller chapters, uh, that definitely is is a little bit more of a struggle than you know, your Texas's and Alabama's and Oklahoma's where the the, the overall uh, graduate brother base is just multiples larger. I mean, so I, I, understanding that is very helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, so Billy, Leslie, Theta Ta, um, I think your database was about 540 brothers. So it wasn't a, um, you know, it wasn't a Texas size database, but we still found um, some really successful Theta Tau graduates that participated at meaningful levels, including the $100,000 yeah, donor. Yeah, we've got like a little over 600, I think, um, in the graduate database now. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we had some great participation. Yeah. And typically we don't pay attention to the guys that graduated within the last five years because a lot of them have gone on to law school or medical school or getting their MBA. So, um, you, you know, you subtract those from the list. Um, uh, there's still, there's still opportunity um, to find some brothers that have capacity. But make sure those people still get the information because we've actually had quite a few that have stepped up to the, the plate on the, the younger graduates. So. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, they still get it, but we wouldn't prioritize them necessarily. Yeah. Hey, Billy, can I ask you a question when, you know, I've, I've been to your chapter as a field secretary 20 years ago. How did you guys make the decision of, you know, renovating the house versus kind of tearing it down and, and starting over? Well, if you've been to our chapter house, you saw what state it was in 20 years ago. Um, I was there. I, I graduated in 1993, so 27 years ago. Um, and it, we, we had been talking about replacing it um, that long ago. I mean, but basically it, it came down to our chapter house was never meant to be a fraternity house. It was built um, um, in the 30s and 40s. It was built for a, a doctor at the hospital locally in Cookville. 
Um, so, I mean, it was a, it would, it was a nice residential home, but it was never meant to have 50 to 70 guys running in and out of it. Um, for, you know, we've owned it since 1986. Um, so, uh, it's, it was just never meant for that kind of lifestyle. And there, it, it would have been, it, it just much easier and cost effective to tear it down and, and rebuild. But I mean, everything was paid for. So that really helped us in the loan process uh, and everything like that. Um, you know, the, the construction loan um, with uh, doing that. So we had a bunch of equity that we already had um, and we just made that a little bit easier. But uh, the house itself was, it, it was just pretty much a disaster. So time to go. Got it. Thanks for that. Um, Bill Oliver, I was told that you have a question. Uh, yeah, Bill Oliver, Penn State. Um, we have a 120 year old house that was built as a fraternity, slate roof. We've recently put in a new boiler and new hot water system. But other than that, um, haven't done too much in the last 20 years. And I'm just wondering in general, uh, for me to go to the other members of my committee, a question for Woody, uh, what kind of fees or costs are we looking for to get a pretty decent analysis of what the house might need in the near and far future? Sure, so uh, in our assessment on, on how we price, and I would say most are, are this way, at least on the housing front, I uh, don't know that many that specialize in the fraternity world like we do on the assessment process, but we just look at the square footage. So uh, they typically, when you uh, look at the square footage, we do 25 cents for the first 10,000, 10 cents for the next 10,000 square feet, and five cents after that. So most houses are gonna run between $2,500 to $3,500 to get the full assessments done. Would that be plus expenses? Yes, plus the okay. travel. I mean, we're, I've been to, uh, Penn State is center of the state of Pennsylvania, obviously, but uh, I've been to Alabama, unfortunately, at a football game. And the fraternities down there, they spend more on their front lawn than we spend on our whole house in yeah. five years. I mean, it's just, it's an unbelievable difference in giving, I guess is the best way to say it. Well, I've driven by I've driven by your house uh, there in Penn State. I've, I've been to campus a couple of times. It's it's beautiful. So I, that it is, but it it needs some work, and uh, I'll be I'll be getting a hold of you soon. Sure, we appreciate what, it. Woody, Woody, Steve, are you, are you guys still doing on-site visits during? COVID or are you kind of slowing down? What, where are you right now in the process of things? Well, I mean, it depends on the clients, right? So with the houses, for the most part, as they're occupied, and let me say this, and I should have said this earlier, right now we're actually, if anybody wants an assessment between now and the end of January 30th, we're not charging travel. So all the expenses are on us because we know right now there's a lot of discussions going on about future investments right the pandemics hurt everyone not only with the loss of rents but then we've also as an industry as a whole we're looking at uh, smaller numbers for the next couple of years because of the demographics of the students coming in the volume of birth rates 20 years ago things of that nature so there's a lot going on certainly in the industry that is uh, spearheading a lot of people trying to take inventory of what they got and what they're going to need to do. So knowing that, that was just, and we know the houses are going to be empty for the most part, a longer winter break. So we thought that might be an ideal opportunity for people to take advantage of getting an assessment done with no one there. Uh, so just know that uh, between now and January 30th, that is something we have going on, but we still make visits. Uh, it's limited, certainly not to the volume that we've done in the past. Uh, and it's on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis in some extraordinary circumstances, but we've had projects that are still going on on many facilities. Uh, and so uh, it, it's certainly been limited uh, compared to the past, but we are making visits for sure. And, and how long does it, oh, sorry, go ahead, Steve. I was gonna say, I'm actually in Indiana tonight uh, for three projects we've got going on up here. So um so yeah we're we're on the road as what he says a little more limited but definitely getting out to try to keep the the ball rolling down the hill and, and woody steve how how long does it take for an assessment to be done um you know from the time that the engagement happens to the time they they get their report 
So typically uh, we can we can get on site within a week, but certainly if there's cost involved uh, in terms of travel, we're going to do our best to keep those as a minimal. But I would say the whole process is about a month uh, from when you ask to we get on site to the report. You know, on we'll send a pre-assessment workbook, which certainly helps speed the process. But by and large, when we send it, we don't get a lot of information back because people just don't know, which is understandable. Uh, when we do the site visit, the site visits are anywhere from three to five hours on average. Uh, now there's bigger houses out there that may creep into a six hour range, but it's, uh, it's typically between, I would say, a, really about a four hour process from beginning to end when they're actually on site uh, for it. And then it takes about a week and a half to two weeks, uh, depending on the time of year. You know, sometimes we've got a lot of activity going on. It could take a little longer to get the full report, but we commit to get those immediate action items out within uh, 48 uh, hours of being there because we know that's if we see something urgent we know people are going to want to take action so we at least try to get that list out to them while they're waiting for the full report uh, woody when you're yeah. on site doing the assessment for that three to five hours or six hours mm -hmm. what involvement do you need from house corporation members so we like to uh, at least have one or two of the house court people there at some point in time. They certainly don't have to be there the whole time walking the facility. You know, Mark, many times we find like a handyman that's been working there forever. They'll hang out for the day. That's like, yeah, we know this and provide some historical information related to the maintenance and wear and tear that's taking place. But we certainly like to spend uh, some time with a few of the house court folks to here's kind of what we're seeing. Tell us a little bit about where your head is. We we do not, by design, we do not let Jeff or Tim know who are the two guys that do most of our assessments before they go. We don't really allude to much of what, why you're reaching out, what you're looking at, unless it's really specific uh, and they need something really specific look like. We try to keep it minimum information so they go in uh, with a little knowledge and, and without any uh, preconceptions of anything. So, uh, and that even sometimes when we have the handyman coming with us, right? They may say, well, that's not really anything big. That's been there forever. And by and large, it could be, but we definitely like to meet for a little bit with the members and we, or the house core folks. And we like to meet with the undergrad leadership. 30 minutes, just, hey, what do you guys like about the house? What you don't like? If you could have anything, what would you want? They may open up a little bit more to us than to an alumni volunteer or something so that they would be anonymous. So we do try to uh, throw those into the visits. Okay. And then afterwards, we uh, once the report is sent, we'll set a call up and we require that we have a call and we will go through the assessment on the phone with everyone so that they understand. It's at a high level. I mean, we're not gonna sit there for hours on end, but that they understand what it, what was seen and why the uh, comments were made were made. And then if they have questions, they can ask. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful to know. Absolutely. Um, Steve Butcher, you have a question or comment? Yes, hi guys. Um, thanks again for giving us your time and expertise. Hey, um, would you guys talk about, so if, if my organization has not, um, my house corporation hasn't done a CapEx or a reserve study, um, talk about maybe how you would recommend that they start working those numbers into their budgets as it applies to rent, right? Because a lot of our, our house corporations, you know, are, are, going to be a little bit shocked when you start adding up some of those numbers and and then figuring out how that plays into um what i got to charge to rent to raise that kind of money yeah um you know, there's a couple of different and that's a great point because again as i said uh, when jason asked earlier kind of what's the the number one thing that the people are making a mistake on is just realizing and especially on the men's side of the equation where we have relied on our, we rely on our volunteers uh, a little bit more in their expertise and showing up. We know a contractor, we know an accountant, we know someone, or we rely on our members for cleaning or, or whatever it may be. When we start introducing professional services, we, had, we didn't really understand what those things cost, right? And assessment's a couple of thousand bucks. If you wanna do a facility or a, a feasibility study, it's gonna be in the 20,000 give or take type range. And then if I get an architect, 
uh, just to even get a program, that's about 10 or 15,000. We just don't, we don't really do a good enough job of understanding what the cost can be. And by and large, to your point on the rent, you know, we, we typically see on the men's side, we're only charging 50 to 60% of market rate on the rents for those areas. Now we may have been doing that because the house is paid for. We may be doing that because it's just, we want to, we want to provide an affordable experience, which is certainly uh, admirable. What, or we just haven't paid attention, which is typically the number one thing that we're seeing, because at the end of the day, we still have to invest. So I think you really have to look at what I would recommend in starting this process is that you look at your rent and what you're charging now as it relates to the market. Look at what room and board is at your university. Make sure that uh, ideally you're at 90 to 95% of what they're charging. And now again, if you're at 60%, that doesn't mean next year you can get to 90. Uh, it's a slow process, but you at least need to recognize where you sit. We still want to provide a, an opportunity for the brothers to live in. We want to make it uh, fair and economical, but we need to be responsible. So if we're at 90 to 95% of what room and board is for the universities, we're normally in good shape. But then also look at what apartments are charging. I uh, know you're never going to compete with five guys living in a you know, 400 square foot house and cramming it all in there for a hundred bucks a month. But look at what is a reasonable market comparison and start from there and know if we're at 60 percent how quickly can we start getting up closer uh to 70 80 90 what that is and it's going to have to be some give and take and i would encourage you to involve the chapter members now understand they rotate in and out quite a bit uh, every four years uh, ideally so in that you have to take their comments for a grain of salt because they're not going to be the ones living there in the future but at the same time, work with them to understand, okay, if, if we were to go in and invest 10 grand into the chapter room and we bumped up rent you know, 3% or 5% or whatever it is, how does that feel? Uh, and then some of those decisions you just have to be willing to make. But I would, I would first start with a market comparison of where your rent sits with the rest of the market and then looking at your total need and how quickly uh, everyone's comfortable in raising rent to get those reserves where you need them. Does that help? Right. Silence is key. Uh, Bob, <laughs> Booth, Bob Boothby, you, you have a, a question or a yes, comment? Yes, hi, it's Bob Boothby from Toronto, uh, up in Canada, but uh, I'm sure my situation's not uh, not isolated and not alone here. Uh, I wanted to get your comments or thoughts. Um, it's kind of a multifaceted question on the approach for renovations for starters, um, based on, uh, I guess, quality of products and, and long lasting. Somebody earlier had mentioned many of our facilities were not designed for heavy use, such as uh, you know a multi-use tenancy or all the fraternity brothers and things that go on within a chapter. Uh, we've got a few options in renovation materials when we're talking about kitchens, bathrooms, et cetera. And you can renovate with light duty products and maybe get a year, maybe two years out of them. Or, you you know, we all desire to have high quality, long lasting products. However, those come at a much higher cost. How do what are your thoughts on that approach? And I guess from the fundraising perspective, we'd like to try to avoid going back to the well multiple times every two or three years for the same renovation. So I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, the renovation approach and, and long-term versus short-term and also on the, the effects that might have on your fundraising approach. Mark, you want me to go first? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, I would say at least the first thing that hit me when you were talking through, especially when you brought up fundraising, is that there not only are your big donors who want to see that you have a plan and you understand what you want the money for they also want to show they also want to dem see demonstration that you know how you're going to protect the asset moving forward how's my money that i'm investing now how are you going to take care of it so to your point that you're not coming back to me every five to ten years or whatever it may be uh you know there's no doubt that fraternities certainly on the men's side of the equation can uh break the highest hardware that we could put in there uh, from a standpoint, uh, regardless of what we think. So you do need to be strategic in some of those areas, but we're also proponents of, we want to set the experience, right? And not necessarily the experience that we want are concrete blocks 
walls everywhere with con concrete floors and drains in the floor so we can go in there with a hose which is what everybody tells you to build we're going to build a prison uh, fortunately though today there are to your point there are materials that are out there that look really nice that are really durable that are made to withstand it you know there's there's tons in terms on the flooring that have come both from pre-engineered and wood. We're doing a project right now in Dallas to where they didn't even go with the standard hardwood. They went with the engineered hardwood just because it's gotten so much superior to standard hardwood in the durability. You, The luxury vinyl tile, which they call, you know, versus just your VCT that you see in all your 1960s schools, the luxury vinyl tile now and what they're doing with that is, is crazy. Um, we're big uh, proponents of the uh, porcelain tile that's out there that looks like wood products in certain areas. You gotta think through noise in some of those cases. On your walls, you know, there's certainly block versus, you know, uh, high impact drywall, things of that nature. You may not need high impact drywall all the way through the house, right? But if you're using the basement for social functions and things of that nature, think of it back there, uh, down there. Uh, we see, when we get into the value engineering on projects and where we recommend folks that they don't uh, necessarily skim on hardware, uh, you get cheap hardware, you're gonna be replacing it all the time and it can be expensive, uh, door handles, things of that nature. But it's an area that if you have so much high activity on those doors day in and day out, you can't skimp on hardware for sure. Uh, your mechanical systems, one of the areas that we see a lot of times that we may get too complex of systems for our house because we want to have everybody to have temperature control. Uh, that's a nice feature, but you need to understand long-term maintenance and cost of that is going to be quite extraordinary. And then I would say on the windows front, so energy, right? Uh, again, that's an easy way to value engineer, but we'd also encourage you to be very careful in what you're looking on the windows because window suppliers come and go. So those are some of the, the areas. I hope I'm, I'm answering your questions and looking at it, but the, the flooring, the hardware, uh, and your uh, HVAC me mechanical systems, just thinking through that preventive maintenance, long-term uh, wear and tear that those things take are areas that we focus a lot on on men housing. I appreciate the feedback very much. I think one of our challenges is trying to blend those elements into uh, a you know, plus 100-year-old house where you've yep. got you know leaded glass and you've got hard heavy hardwood and and so on and so on but uh, definitely appreciate the comments uh, thanks mark any uh, anything on the fundraising side yes so um to woody's comment about you know our graduates want to know how you're going to protect the asset uh, i worked several years ago with our fiji chapter at miami of ohio they built a brand new house because their uh, other house uh, burned it was arson but one of the things that the the graduates decided to do was use the high impact drywall that that woody referenced because all it takes is one brother uh coming in late at night after maybe some uh visits to the local establishments comes in late and punches the wall um and he luckily luckily because of the high impact drywall, um, doesn't put a hole in the wall. But the brothers might see him the next morning with a cast on his, um, <laughs> on his hand. That is the best way to protect the asset. And my sense was when they made the decision to spend that extra, I think Woody, it was about 25% more than traditional drywall. And it may, I, I don't know what the cost is today, um, but the graduate brothers made that decision and uh, they were very, very successful in their fundraising. Uh, yeah. So sometimes, Bob, if you're using higher priced materials that withstand more, you'll actually raise more money. Sure. And I would say, too, on the older home, just a real quick additional thought is thinking through this. I mean, you know, it sounds like you've got some the lead glass could be gorgeous the the floors could be beautiful and there's nothing wrong with trying to preserve some of those elements uh and it could be just a conversation with again the undergraduates and the alums to say okay we've got a lot of history these beautiful homes uh you know it's just, i was on a call uh, yesterday with an alum who is just heartbroken that they're going to knock down the old house and go completely new and he's trying literally for us to find somebody that would take it 
and they'll move the entire house, right? So there's some of those key elements of the facility that are unique that you may want to try to preserve while introducing some of these uh, other materials that are cost effective, energy effective, things of that nature uh, in other places of the house. And I would say on an older home too, don't forget about the foundation, don't forget about uh, landscaping and your uh, slopes and all the water getting away from the house, because that's certainly something over time that we see on the older homes that we, we really need to address water intrusion, the foundation, uh, some of those core pieces of the facility. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, Mark, that brings up a good question. Is the fundraising message different if you're trying to do a renovation versus a teardown and a rebuild? Um, you know, I ask because, uh, you know, our, uh, many of our graduates have a tie to the physical chapter house that they were in. Um, does, does the message change between the, the two? Sometimes, sometimes we've had uh, brothers tell us that they absolutely won't support a new chapter house because their memories are in the old facility. And then we've had other brothers tell us, you know, the facility is not Phi Gamma Delta. It's my lifelong friendships and the brothers that is Phi Gamma Delta. Um, and as luck would have it, I guess, and, and I'd rather be lucky than good, uh, the brothers that tell us it's not the structure, that it's the lifelong friendships, uh, I can count numbers of cases where those brothers were the largest donors. So they were willing to put their money where their mouth is um, and fund new new structures. And uh, I, I will tell Jason, the, one of the other things that we point out often is some of these old homes are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, However, if it is going to be maintained as a fraternity house, uh, ultimately it's going to come down to the safety, health, and welfare of our younger brothers that live there. And if the house uh, is old enough that there is still lead piping somewhere in there, uh, there might be asbestos. Um, I can think of a particular chapter in Phi Gamma Delta I worked with that they wanted to renovate their home that was about, I think it was 90 years old. And renovations through the years, uh, asbestos was in there, there was lead, there was some kind of deadly material or chemical in the, uh, the linoleum flooring. Um, and Woody, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in building materials, but all I, know was, all I know was it was a health nightmare. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have to take we have to take the, the welfare of our undergraduates into consideration. And yeah. yes, beautiful house, but, you know, you don't want them coming out dead. Yep. Right. I appreciate that. Um, Paul, I was told that you have a comment or. The comments a little too late for where we're in the conversation, so I'm going to hold that one. I do want to make a comment very at, right near the end. So let's make sure everybody else has had a chance. Sure. Any other questions, comments uh, for Mark or Woody or, or anyone else? This is Billy one more time. Um, if you're thinking about it at all, go ahead and start, at least with the study of some point or, or, or just go ahead and, and, and start because it, it doesn't get any easier as you wait and it doesn't get any less expensive. So go ahead and at least uh, get some type of study or something in paper so you know what you're talking about with your graduates. Yeah, great point. All right, Paul, we'll go back to you if, uh, this before we wrap up. This is just a humorous coincidence. The um, About two minutes after we started, my son, my my son sent me a text message thinking of you type thing. And uh, I then said, well, I was looking at Mark and um, my son founded a small fundraising company that competes with Mark, obviously small. So I just thought it was absolutely hilarious that he and I did an exchange. It's Eric Heininger Eden Plus fundraising for you, Mark. 
It's is your son of Fiji? Yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Do not I crush him. I thought it Mark. would make you chuckle, and that was my goal. Yeah. No, that's where does where does he live? Des Moines, Iowa. Mm. Nowhere near Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I do have one other comment, Mark. Please vote on Jan on January fifth. Oh yes, yeah. We had a little political predicament in Georgia uh, last week, as we all know, I'm sure. <laughs> right, right. All right. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I, I'll remind everyone that this webinar was recorded, um, and we will be posting it to uh, the website. Uh, along with all the other webinars that we've done uh, over the last year or so. Um, and I just want to remind everyone of the resources available to our housing corporations uh, on our website. Um, you can go to the, the, the main Phi Gamma Delta page and oh, as Dio's showing right now and other under housing, uh, you'll, you'll find all of our, um, all of our resources available to you. So, um, want to thank uh, Woody and Mark for their time. Steve, thank you for your time. Uh, we really appreciate all the all the work you guys did uh, and, and all your good advice uh, for our chapters. Um, within the presentation and as a follow-up, we will send out Mark and Woody and Steve's uh, contact information if you'd like to get in contact with them uh, for uh, additional conversation or to talk a little bit more about how they can help you or uh, we'd be happy for you, uh, for you guys to um, connect with them. So. Um, also want to thank Dio for all his work behind the scenes um, and for putting up with me. Dio, thank you very much for organizing. Um, we hope everyone is doing well um, and you continue to do well. If, if you need any of us on the housing committee, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, either to myself or to Steve uh, or to Dio himself. So um, again, we appreciate your time tonight and uh, have a good evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.